Atticus. Oh, that was going. Yeah, it was hilarious. So the guy started talking to me. It was supposed to be 40 minutes. It went for one hour. And he then said, okay, well, thanks, Mark. That was great. I said to him, yeah, but, you know, you haven't asked me a question about data laws yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think, uh, all right. I think the settings are all okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the, uh, the episode number 23 of Art of Law. Um, as you can see, we have a special guest with us in addition to, to our, our, our usual special guest, Mark. Um, today we have Atticus, Atticus Zhao. He's a partner at the Shanghai office who has built uh, a little practice on, um, on data and cybersecurity, especially uh, as it relates to automobiles and, uh, um, and uh, autonomous uh, uh, driving. So we thought that uh, this, um, this uh, personal information protection law, the people, which we'll ref I'll, I'll refer to as people throughout the, the, the episode, is uh, very near and dear to his heart. Um, so we've asked him to, to join us as well. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I will be keeping an eye on the chat. If anyone has any questions about any of this, uh, any of these topics, just go ahead and feel free to put it in the chat and I'll make sure that Atticus and Mark get to them uh, at the appropriate time and uh, that they answer your questions. They can't, they can't hide from us. So um, uh, everybody will get a copy of this presentation who's registered through the Eventbrite uh, website. And uh, so no need to take notes or anything like that. Um, and once you do get a copy of the PDF, you can click on some of these links uh, that, I'll, that I'll bring up uh, throughout this presentation so that you can follow along um, on the YouTube recording as well, which will be up on the YouTube channel. So, um, Mark, uh, as we usually like to do, uh, we like to take, take a step back and kind of look at how we got here. Um, you know, the, 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 the people uh, law uh, that we're going to be discussing today is kind of like I was thinking about it, kind of a culmination. And you've lived in, in China for such a long time. Um, I guess you've seen some of this um, building up in a, in a sense. So. If you could just give us, I put here some, I guess, important dates of, you know, some of the big tech companies, as well as some of the, uh, some of the different types of laws as well. But if you kind of just want to give us a little bit of your thoughts on, uh, you know, the foundation, the founding of these companies, the introduction of some of these laws, and just how you've seen it all grow. Right, thanks. For, yeah, so just so everybody know, we haven't seen the slides, so this makes it very exciting. So Sean just finished the slides this morning, I think. Uh, so yeah, it's a surprise that Tencent was founded before Alibaba. I didn't know that. Uh, so I think, yeah, what's interesting is, um, you know, if you looked at 20 years ago, the richest 400 people in China, I'd say probably 398 of them would have been uh, real estate related. And now I think if you look at the list, you know, the biggest single group of uh, rich people, you know, are people who um, made money through the tech boom. Yeah, of course, there's the Maotai guy and the Nongfu Springs guy. But if you look at the, the vast numbers, it's all tech. And I guess, yeah, if you look at companies like Tencent, you know, with WeChat and uh, Baidu with the search engine, Alibaba, I guess you could have put in DD as well and, you know, all these other uh, companies, uh, you know, ByteDance, um, yeah, all these companies uh, have been founded relatively uh, recently, but probably it's fair to say China took even longer to, you know, the, uh, the government to deal with, you know, some issues. And so I think the cybersecurity issue was the first one they looked at. Um, and then, you know, cybersecurity was mostly, if you put it in a nutshell, was about safe and secure technology. So I think people overreacted a lot as the foreign companies and people often do. So I think the cybersecurity law was mostly a response to seeing like the Edward Snowden and the Stuknex uh, type stuff where Chinese regulators were concerned that all of these foreign companies who were vendors may have back doors to unfriendly elements. And uh, you know they needed to make sure that for critical information, um, uh, uh, infrastructure that these were safe. So I think it made a lot of sense. Um, you know, before the cybersecurity law came in, 
there were very few little regulations. I think the biggest thing that we knew about privacy uh, data breach was I think Dun & Bradstreet a long time ago, uh, they were called out for having transported 6 million personal information or pieces of or six, personal information on 6 million people you know, out of the country and having acquired it. And they were pulled out under a criminal law provision, which didn't seem really fit for purpose. So I think when China started looking at this, it was firstly about safe and secure um, uh, technology. And also if you wanted to sell to big state-owned companies or if you wanted to sell to the banking institutions or utilities, you know, there's like nine different kinds of sectors, well, then you have to undergo a security assessment and or you know, for CBRC, you have to be on a list of suppliers for their tenders. The e-commerce law, I guess that's in there because there are some consumer requirements. So I think the data security law, similar to cybersecurity law, was more about the integrity of the system. And then I think, you know, with um, e-commerce law, it's one law where it started to talk a bit about the rights of consumers. And I think that the, the people law is really about personal information, protecting it. You know, I'm not an expert in GDPR, but it seems to me that it's like GDPR, a little bit different, uh, but it is there to protect consumers' rights over personal data. And it will affect you know, almost every company working with or in China, or actually rather, if you're working in China, for sure you're gonna be affected. But even if you're working offshore, if you are interacting with Chinese people's uh, personal data, you will also be affected. And uh, at the end of this presentation, um, I don't think we'll cover it during the, the webinar itself, but there is a, a couple slides comparing the GDPR with people uh, so that you can get, if you're familiar with GDPR or your IT team is, um, it, it can be a quick uh, reference guide to you know figuring out where are the differences. Um, but I guess what we'll start off with here, and I broke this presentation into two sections. First is about people generally, but then the second part is going to be about uh, how does it relate to your business? And I think that's basically the crux of it. But but we should start here naturally, I, I think, Mark. So, uh, you know, what is people? And I think particularly the uh, uh, for people playing at home, actually, I think uh, what I can do here is, oops, is uh, if you would like, there is an official Chinese version at that website uh, in the red box, but in the blue box, there is an unofficial English translation from Stanford University. Um, I think if you, can, if you just want to Google it, you can uh, you know just get a look at the uh, English translation uh, if you want to follow throughout the, the presentation. But Mark, maybe just in a nutshell, what is uh, what is people? Well, I think people that need people are the luckiest people in the world. Sure, that's what I want to say first. So look, I think the uh, it's a it's a law that's come out. I guess it's you know the shorthand will be China's GDPR. Uh, perhaps the difference is GDPR gave um, people <laughs> or gave uh, companies two years to transition. Uh, China often likes to do things more quickly, and it's given people two months. So. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult. I don't think there's going to be a hard hit, but basically it's a comprehensive uh, law dealing with how companies in particular interact with consumers' data. It gives consumers much more rights about opting in. Um, you know, in China, we, you know, even today I've got still two calls uh, from people trying to sell me financial products or car insurance. I can't remember what they were talking about. Uh, but, you know, you know, it's been for a long time uh, people have felt that they haven't gotten uh, you know, control over their data. So this will allow you to opt in, set limits, know what people are doing with your data. You know, those apps that, you know, ask for permission to use your microphone, scan other programs, all those kind of things. And then I think there's some aspects which are perhaps a bit more you know, Chinese in nature, like the cybersecurity law. It does, you know, have extraterritorial reach, a bit like the cosmetics um, new law. If you are not in China, you will have to have a domestic representative responsible uh, for this because you know, that kind of makes it easier to take action. And you know, there'll be big penalties. Um, I mean, uh, you know, sizable penalties, I think it was 5% of uh, revenue uh, potentially. So I think it's a big deal and yeah. it will make people rethink how they interact with uh, especially consumers, but also employees, um, suppliers, distributors, 
you know, anybody's personal information, also biometric. I mean, I think it's also a law which is pretty modern because, you know, uh, things like uh, voice recognition, you just think about it, if you're using apps, how often they're scanning your face, how often are they uh, taking your voice recording, uh, fingerprints, perhaps less often, but yeah. you know, that kind of, it's a modern law to protect people, uh, uh, citizens, not people, individuals' rights you know, over their data. I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. We'll cover some of those uh, different aspects in a little bit more detail, uh, but there's a lot to unpack. Um, I think basically my takeaway putting uh, some of these slides together is that there is a there is actually quite a lot um, to discuss, um, but how much of it is actually going to you know really affect your business will you know depend on your your business and how much data you're dealing with. But um, it seems that there's a little bit. It, it touches on a little bit of uh, everything, uh, as Mark as Mark said. So um, I don't know, Mark and Atticus. I guess you guys can share the duties here, but I guess these are the. This is kind of the the gist of it for the most part. Are you know what are the main changes? I guess from uh, people compared to you know the cybersecurity law or the the data security law or the e-commerce law because uh, before it seemed like a lot of those different um, laws uh, kind of inferred how people or how companies uh, should treat personal information. So, you know, this, this is like the, def the people law is the definitive, you know, text that, that's going to be regulating uh, how to use um, and transfer and all of those other things, the, the biometrics, data, uh, personal information. So what are the main changes that we have now with this definitive text versus kind of the inferences that we, um, you know, would have to make before. Atticus, do you wanna? Yeah, oh. sure. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, maybe just uh, for, the, um, for the big changes, I think, you know, uh, compared to the cybersecurity law and the data security law, um, the PRPL, I think is now, is obviously focused on personal information um, you know, from the history of the legislation of the PIPL, you know, China has, um, uh, you know, uh, loose, loose, uh, loose regulations uh, in, in, relation, in relation to protect of personal information in different, uh, you know, regulations, laws. Now it's combined in one, uh, you know, um, uh, PIPL. And uh, specifically, for example, this um, um, exactly uh, uh, address you know, how to access, correct, or how to you know store, uh, uh, how to you know people want to transfer their data, how to uh, delete if they are not happy, they maybe you know withdraw their consent. All the specific rights and clearly addressed in the in the PRPL. So Mark, maybe you can add more thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah, so I think, look, I think the thing is with the individuals, I think it's firstly very legitimate. And I think, um, you know, a bit of a controversial view is, um, you know, uh, I think the Snowden case showed that Western governments, you know, continually hack the information of citizens. Uh, at least in China, there's no mystery. You know, the government does have access to that information. But I think the difference is in uh, the West, it seems that governments are scared of the big tech companies, but in China, big tech is scared of the government. So I think, you know, if you really look at it, it's not about making life harder for somebody. It's actually people, you can do about cybersecurity, other laws, but the people law is really about protecting individuals' rights about how your um, uh, information is being used. And, you know, it has certain kinds of things which also reflected in the automotive um, data law, where it's about you shouldn't take more law, uh, more data than you require. You shouldn't keep it for longer than you need to. You shouldn't transfer it. You know, uh, we have to know who's doing it. So some of the things which is just so strange that we've been confronted with over the last few years is that clients would take data from people, even very sensitive data like health data, and they would just hand it over to some other party to do the processing with no real contract, no protections in place. So I think... It is very legitimate. I think it affects things like data transferring, which is fair. It uh, requires companies to put in management systems and controls. Look, if you're a US company, it's more understandable because they don't really have a very strong codified data regulations. They got some in California, but they don't have like a national strong thing like GDPR. Uh, but if you're a European company, 
why have you not afforded Chinese consumers the same rights as European consumers? So I think these, it's, it's just making, it's an upgrade. Uh, data localization, I know Atticus has been working on this with a couple of German tech companies. Do you want to talk a bit about it? I think data localization, it's a worry, but it's not as bad as people think. It's not like there's a big wall, you know, keeping everything in, but maybe you have a different opinion, uh, or maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the data localization, because that's one of the issues that the tech companies are worried about with collaboration and things like that. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that's uh, big data uh, localization is one of the concerns uh, for many international companies. Uh, I think generally on the GDPR, there is no specific localization requirement, but uh, uh, for China, before the PIPL, actually, you know, um, under the cybersecurity law uh, and also data security law, which uh, take effect uh, this September, um, the cybersecurity law, you know, uh, three years ago, um, so there's also uh, already a requirement on lo data localization. Um, so uh, under cybersecurity law, the data uh, localization is um, uh, kind of, you know, um, try to protect the, the data um, from the, uh, for the, you know, CIO, uh, critical information uh, instruction operator. Uh, so that's the key um, focus of the cybersecurity law. Um, under that requirement is uh, all the, um, all the personal information and, uh, and important data collected and generated in China should be stayed locally, stored locally. And if we want to transfer those data outside China, you need to do the statutory assessments with the yeah. Chinese government. So that's under the cybersecurity law. And for the PIPL, uh, this inherit this, um, uh, this uh, requirement, but added the one more things for the individual uh, personal information. Um, that is required that, you know, uh, for, for, for the um, uh, processor, data processor, they handled certain level of uh, or volume of personal information that need to do, need has to be, um, 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 you know, to store this data localized, lo uh, lo in local, locally. And if you um, try to send them offshore, uh, you need to go through this uh, statutory process. So that's um, that's the the the, the um, data localization requirement. Um, I think the key thing that a Chinese government really uh, care about is is the national security and the public interest. Maybe that's more about is uh, national security. Um, so if if companies you know really um, operate um, products in these sensitive areas, this may be a you know big impact on that. But it, for general, you know, business, uh, maybe you know, the impact is is limited, uh, if I may say. Yeah, I think we will get into a, a little bit more on some of the those topics, but it's good that you mentioned them now. I think uh, I just got a question from the chat, and uh, it was a question about consent, and especially, um, well, the question was about consent in relation to the GDPR, which, like I said, uh, there'll be a couple slides towards the end that get to that, which uh, I will email out um, after the, the webinar. But um, the issue, so we talked a little bit about data, but maybe we can also talk a little bit about consent and what does that mean for um, the burden of the, 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 the data collectors. Um, Mark? Yeah, so, so I think consent is, it has to be, um explicit uh if it's uh yeah and it, it, it's not going to be they're going to require things like pop-up windows i mean i think it doesn't mention that in the law but that's the clear thing so once you want your data done in a certain way uh, there'll be another explicit consent if it's a uh, if it's a more sensitive data uh, biometric data will be sensitive matter anybody under 14 their data will be important so so the definition of sensitive personal i just saw it just pop up now so the sense of personal data, just off the top of my head, was uh, like your personal information, medical or health information, biometric information, under 14-year-old uh, uh, information. So that will need special permission. Special permission. Yeah. So, so that will be the, the, the kind of consent that we're looking at. I think uh, when you're going to transfer that kind of consent overseas, it's going to be requiring those kind of assessments from the CIC, the cybersecurity uh, people. And then, you know, the other big issue about the consent is you can withdraw the consent. So you will need, someone just wrote here, do you need, the 14-year-olds will need their guardian or parental consent. 
So that was just a question that popped up. So I think um, the, the issue is that consent can be withdrawn, which is very important because um, otherwise your data can be held forever. So companies will really have to do segregation of data. So you're gonna to have to have an option for somebody to um, withdraw the consent. Uh, you're gonna to have to have an option where somebody only wants their information used in certain ways. And what's also important is that the other practical effect of consent is you can opt out of algorithmic um, uh, calculations. So, you know, if you go on a website looking to book a hotel, they'll often use your kind of information to target what price they're going to set. Uh, this can't be uh, possible. So the, the, the um, big tech companies will not be able to use your data against you to make a decision which would impact you. So if I said, I don't consent to give you the information, they can't give me a different price than say Atticus who has provided the information. And so the Atticus. services can't be decoupled from consent. So I yeah. think that'll be important. Uh, the processing, you know, they'll also wanna know, you're gonna have to tell people who's using it. You're gonna be able to have to give people access to their, uh, give them copies if they want of their information. Uh, and then I think the collecting of information public places, I'm not sure exactly what there's about, but that's probably mostly about CCTV cameras. And, you know, one of our pet topics, Atticus and I, we are interested in autonomous cars. You know, these autonomous cars are like vacuum cleaners hoovering up lots of um, information. You saw Tesla have the issue with the cameras taking too much information near sensitive areas. So I think this will be the issue. Also, like, you know, in the office, uh, in Shenzhen, not in Shanghai. Shanghai, we just have a pass. But in the Shenzhen office, uh, there's a facial recognition camera that looks at you before you go into the building. So all this kind of data and the consent to doing this is going to make life a little bit more difficult. I don't think it's terribly difficult. So let's say if you're an associate in the Shenzhen office, uh, we will have to offer them an alternative way to enter the building other than facial recognition. So they'll be able to use a pass or something like that. Atticus, do you have more points on the consent? Uh, Atticus, I have a question for you. I think um, I think Mark got to the you know ex, uh, you know explicit consent. Uh, I got another question from the chat about how does this separate consent uh, idea uh, work? You know, is it like a separate sort of um, you know pop-ups that uh, people will have to kind of click through? I understand right now the you know the the whole impl implementation of of this is still kind of you know up in the air but maybe you could just discuss a little bit about what is what does separate consent mean uh because this is one of those key differences between um people and the gdpr so if if you have any thoughts on that yeah yeah sure thanks uh so uh on the prpl the people uh the separate consent is referred to this uh, uh i think the five uh circumstances that requires uh separate consent um, um so this means that this this consent, those information collected is uh, is sensitive or important for the for the data subject. For example, um, you know the people you public those personal information you collected. For example, you public them in the on on, you know, on the internet or you know other public places, or you you know you provide the data you collected from from uh, from the individual and you you know you you provide to third parties. All those, as Mark mentioned, you know. Uh, and those um, data that's uh, uh, connected to uh, closely connected to the data subjects. Um, so I think uh, you know, in terms of a separate consent, I think the way is there may be many ways to do that. But um, I, I think the most important thing is uh, this should be uh, uh, consented by the data subject in a separate way um, uh, compared to the, for example, normal. Uh, some of the consent is made in a package. They just you know give you a list and it just you know tick tick and they just all all those things are great, um, but in the in the in a separate consent um, this may not be you know uh, um, uh, kind of you know uh, bounded with other consents together. Uh, this should be you know separately agreed. For example, um, maybe you know this uh, this uh, specific situation I need to pump up a separate consent and the, you know the box bump up. And you need to uh, give them the opportunity, the uh, you know the choice to to select that. And also, um, there are some uh, situations that maybe you 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 obtain their consent already, 
but but if you change this the uh, use of the uh, data subject uh, the, the the data uh, for example you provide this data to a third party uh, but it previously the data subject already agree with that but now you change the purpose or the way you want to use and then you has to uh, have to uh, obtain a separate consent which means that uh, the data subject uh, clearly knows that you change the purpose or the way that you use and they uh, expressly agree with that. So that's the you know, general picture of the separate consent. Yeah. And I like Mark's example of the, the employees, you know, using facial recognition to get into the office. I think that's one of those scenarios where, you know, it's when they, when in a, let's just say for an example, an employee signs a kind of a, like, like you said, a packaged <laughs> consent of, you know, uh, I consent to use, you know, give you my name, my address, this type of stuff. But, you know, once you start getting to the sensitive personal information, then you might, the separate consent idea can get quite uh, interesting quite fast. Um, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this one. And I, I think I'll, I'll get back, I'll circle back to this, but um, the impact assessment on personal information. Um, yeah, I think I'll circle back to this one. But these slides, we just have a lot to unpack and we only have about maybe 30 minutes left. Um, and this was this slide is about the, 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 the concept that Mark was talking about, the autom automatic decision making about, for example, how you can search for a hotel on uh, your, your browser, but then go into the private browser and search for another one to give you a different price. So um, these, type, this, these types of practices um, definitely will be uh, scrutinized. Um, so maybe we get straight into it's not talking so much about people. Uh, if you want to read the law, you can read it yourself. It's um, it's it's pretty clear at some of the effects, but maybe we get a little more philosophical and how does it actually you know apply in real life? I guess this is kind of like what I yeah, what I think most people here would be interested in in discussing. Um, so Mark, we talk. I think we we talk a, a, a lot for, for our usual viewers here. We talk a, a lot about um, you know uh, the, the 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 purpose behind some of these regulations, and uh, you know is it is it out to get me or is it out to get you know uh, why uh, what is the what is the motivation behind these things? Um, the 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 fact that this is. Uh, um, we just talked about in the last art of law with the education uh, uh, shakeup. So uh, why should people care about, why, why should companies care about people? And, um, and I think there are some very interesting reasons that you've given me to, to put on the slide here. People are the center of our business, but also people, <laughs> maybe we should call it people. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> people. Uh, so look, I think the thing is, look, it's only been a few weeks. So we've had a bit of a heads up because We've been dealing with a lot of tech companies and they've had questions about moving data around. Uh, so it's new. Uh, it's coming very soon. Like, you know, you have to be compliant first of November. Uh, it applies more broadly, like cybersecurity and all that stuff. People are very upset about it. Uh, but when you really looked at the practical effects, it really only would have affected, you know, 2% of foreign companies, you know, it was already that you might not be able to sell a product without a security assessment to someone very big. This is much more broad. I think, uh, I didn't write it in the article, but yeah, well, I guess it is, it's legitimate rights. So, you know, it's difficult to say, oh, the Chinese government's being nasty to us, but the Chinese government's actually just implementing very legitimate rights for individuals about their personal data. And I think, you know, governments have to play catch up the digital world moves much faster. Like we saw in your first slide, you know, Alibaba and that they've been around for 15 years and only now we're dealing with issues about, you know, rights of privacy and things like that. So it's going to affect a lot of companies. Even if you're not consumer facing, you're going to have to protect the rights of your employees, uh, your distributors, your suppliers, everybody's collecting this kind of personal information. It'll be less bad for you, but you know, consumer facing companies will be you know, very much at risk or digital uh, companies will be. The other thing is the penalties have real teeth. I mean, I think, you know, in the past, you know, we often would look at, you know, risks and, you know, one of the issues would be, somebody's scaring me there, someone behind you, Atticus. Okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah, one of the issues is, you know, uh, oh, you know, if you do this, you may face a penalty of 20,000 RMB. So people felt like, well, that's, a, you know, that I can live with that. These penalties are much more serious. 
And then I think perhaps the most interesting thing is, uh, which I don't think people have talked about very much in the articles I've looked at, is we have a regulator, as we can see, has taken on Didi, you know, talked to ByteDance about their things, uh, somebody who's really taken down many, many different apps about breaking data transfer. So we've got a regulator who's willing to take on anybody. But I think for foreign companies, which is much more uh, an issue, is that the law allows individuals to take action. So I think we will see uh, you know, lots of employees get upset about certain things, but even more so lots of consumers. And I think, you know, ask any consumer facing brand in China, what are they scared of? They're scared of consumers. So I think we'll see a lot of that. And then one which you missed here, Sean, and number five, I think we'll see a lot of self-regulation because I think the biggest target, I don't know, maybe it's on the next slide, but the biggest targets are the big e-commerce and big tech platforms. So I think if you've got an e-commerce type business or you really rely on WeChat or you really rely on uh, Alibaba or Baidu, you know, they will regulate you because they don't want to get in trouble because you're not compliant. So yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of self-regulation and this will impact a lot of companies. Yeah, uh, that's that's right. And and that'll come in a, in a future slide. Uh, but this slide right here, I'll just I'll just take I'll just take this one, guys. Um, will people affect my company? And to be quite honest, you know, just to echo what Mark just said, it's it's so broad that it's hard to see how you cannot be affected by this uh, by the by this law, which is kind of the big difference between some of the the previous uh, regulations that have been passed. Like Mark said, here are just a list of uh, you know. Uh, these all are all different verticals, um, but they all get touched pretty much the same, but in different ways. Um, uh, you can, you know, uh, we, I don't want to read through all of these uh, specifically, but uh, you can see which one your company belongs to. And uh, the reason why we think that people might um, be affected to your company. Um, one of the things, I don't know if Atticus is still around, but one of the, the, the interesting parts of uh, the text of people is this idea of personal information protection officers or these representatives. Um, Atticus, uh, maybe you can just give us a, a, a quick uh, uh, breakdown of this, you know, new requirement on, uh, on both domestic companies, but also companies abroad um, and how it relates to, you know, whether appointing officers or appointing representatives. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. So I think uh, under the uh, PIPL, there's a, a new requirement on the, you know, for companies to appoint uh, like, uh, you know, DPO kind of uh, position. For example, if uh, um, um, if a company collect, uh, collect information reach the threshold of uh, uh, CAC, you know, the main authority that are in charge of this area, um, there's, a, there's kind of, you know, DPO position will be, should be established. Um, so that this is um, uh, one of the, them, and uh, and also um, I think for uh, as Mark mentioned in the very beginning that this law has the ex exterritorial effects, um, so that for foreign companies that are doing e-commerce and uh, uh, if they don't have the, any representative in China or don't have um, uh, have a wolfie or entity in China, they have to appoint a uh, China representative or established uh, uh, entity to represent. Uh, in China and uh, um, uh, to dealing with this, um, uh, you know, data collection, all those uh, related activities with uh, uh, personal information. So they also need to report this, uh, um, for example, the names of the officer or representative uh, and they, uh, to the authority, uh, likely to the CAC, or to all those information to them. So that's, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, um, that's, uh, uh, um, in this situation, that's uh, um, the role of you know, representative um, or entities to be established to, to enforce or kind of protect personal information. So uh, I got a question. Does this uh, officer, you know, representative, do they have to be a Chinese citizen or can they be based out of China? And, I, and, and you just said that, um, uh, it, you know, it could be an individual, but it also could be a, a, a dedicated entity. And by the way, this uh, this text of people is from the 
is from that Stanford University link that I, 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 uh, I put in the beginning of the presentation. So I'm pulling the, the text from that translation. Uh, so, but anyways, back to the question, Atticus, uh, is there any um, requirements on the nationality of, of the people, of the, of the officer or representative? Um, the law has, does not you know, clearly say that this should be a China national. Um, uh, this, there's no specific requirement on the, you know, the position. Uh, but I feel that, that this should, uh, um, should, uh, should be a, uh, you know, Mandarin speaking. Otherwise, you know, um, you know, the Chinese authority are unable to connect, communicate with the, with the representative. That may be you know, an issue in practice. Yeah, actually, sure. yep. Sure. So I think I've got a theory on this. I think um, the most similar thing to this is under the cosmetics law, whereas yeah, if you were importing saying. cosmetics, uh, you had to have a local representative. And this has been around for a long time. And, you know, a few years ago, you could just appoint some guy you met at the train station, you know, a uh, foreigner, China, as long as they were in China. Uh, there's no nationality requirements uh, for that, but they've recently upgraded the requirements that you actually have to know what you're doing. So my guess would be that the implementing measures will give requirements. And so the people who will be in trouble, if you've got a woofy, you can probably deal with it or a joint venture. Uh, but I think the real issue will be, uh, you will not find somebody who's going to willing to do this for you because uh, you know, data, it's like you know, the cosmetics, what they were worried about is if there's a product recall, if suddenly a product you know, injures people or something, you, know, you need to have somebody who's accountable. And I think what we'll see is that this um, you know, DPO uh, uh, person will face a lot of liability and how would you sign up for it if you don't know what's happening within the company. So this, I think, is going to be a big issue for people. Maybe not now, but maybe in a year's time when they get around to you know, issuing the implementation measures. And I believe yeah. the, li the legal liability part actually gets to some of the, the personal liabilities of the DPO. Um, so it is, it is a very real threat. Um, Atticus, did you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Actually, we have already, you know, um, have this problem issues raised by a client, and uh, this, you know, obviously um, on the GDPR, there's a specific uh, qualification um, requirement for the DPO. Um, so there's also a system in place that you know how to uh, uh, if they perform their duties, so they should be uh, exempted from you know kind of penalty from the from the from the company. For example, the company cannot fire them because they perform their duties. Um, but um, but on currently the, the system established by PRPL is just very high level. And uh, uh, we believe that there should be you know, implementation rules, but at the moment um, there's just very general requirement. But as Matt, Mark mentioned, there should be you know, practical issues, um, you know, how to address the re real issue. The DPO um, uh, is likely that you, know, you need to understand all the requirements, all those stuff. So, um, that may be in you know, a specific um, for local people. Yeah. Um, this next slide, thanks for the questions, everybody. Um, so Mark discussed this a little bit earlier, but who will enforce people? And it's actually the Cyberspace Administration of China. And um, actually the last two bullet points here kind of go to that self-regulation um, part that, uh, that Mark, that idea that Mark was uh, uh, throwing around earlier is the fact that, uh, and I put the text here, Article 58, that people are singling out uh, some of these important internet platforms, the, 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 the Chinese domestic ones, and uh, kind of pers puts a little bit of burden on them to kind of ensure that uh, the, 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 the companies that they're servicing are in compliance as well. So there will be a little bit of uh, sharing of the burden in terms of enforcement. Um, you'll have on one hand, the CAC, but on the other hand, you'll probably also have the, if you're using um, uh, one of the, the cloud services, for, for example, you'll probably uh, get some of, the, um, some of the attention from them as well. Uh, I, I kind of want to get through these slides because we only have about 20 minutes left. Um, but just Atticus and Mark, if you had anything to, to add to that, just uh, let me know. But I want to let me be Mark, uh, I'll let you get to this part, because this is, I guess, kind of the other issue that we've seen 
before. This is not something new that's uh, new to um, the, the, the PIPL. Uh, we've seen this kind of professional consumers in the past with uh, retail clients. Um, the fact that uh, individual consumers can kind of, I guess, become professional in a way that they can identify um, uh, where companies are lacking uh, uh, their regulatory you know, duties and responsibilities and they kind of attack them to uh, make sure that they're getting, uh, whether they're getting like punitive damages, those types of things. Now, I don't know if that's good, exactly the same as the PIPL, but there is this theme here that you've alluded to that uh, consumers, these individuals are getting much more power, even power to bring uh, some of these claims to a court, for example. So uh, maybe you just want to flesh out that idea a little bit more. I think you know, the, I don't think it's a professional consumer situation. It's a professional consumer is the people that will look for uh, mislabeling ingredients, buy up, and then seek to make a profit on what they spend the money. I don't think that's what it's going to be. Um, I think the the issue here is uh, yeah, it's not in great detail. It just says you know if the company doesn't do stuff, then Chinese individuals, not always consumers. I mean, it could be employees as well they would have the ability to go before the courts. And you know, so it's, it's not very detailed, but I think if you look at how things are interacting nowadays, there was a case recently with Schwarzkopf, the shampoo company, where the consumers you know, brought claims. And you know, I think the issue is uh, we've got clients who come to us because a consumer has made a complaint on a hotline, you know, or I don't know if it's a hotline sounds like a telephone, but normally it's a, you know, they would log on and make a complaint. And the authorities have to follow them up, even if they don't feel that they're great complaints. So I think the issue will be for companies, if you don't address this um, and consumers get wind of it, you're going to have lots of visits from CAC or SAMR, because yeah, you know, CAC is the main one, but there'll be other people looking at this in different ways. So, you know, if it's consumer, it might be SAMR, if it's much more the big tech guys, it might be MIIT. And you know, the, the difficulty is this law will somehow also interconnect with other laws you know, for specific sectors. But I think on the consumers, we've seen it in the last 10 years, and I think this will be a big problem. There was the case in Hangzhou, the guy didn't want to give his facial recognition to enter the zoo or something. So people are taking it more seriously. And like that article you said, like how many apps have they taken down in the last five years? Uh, and you know, a lot of the information are scams. So this is not protecting good corporate citizens. It's mostly protecting people from thieves and fraudsters. Uh, yeah. So I think it's good. And I think uh, 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 maybe Atticus, you can, you can chime in here, but um, uh, Mark, you alluded to some of, you, you alluded that you know, PIPL has real teeth, real, real consequences. Um, and we've discussed a little bit about the, the financial aspect of it, but you know, like you just said, uh, the remove the removal of apps could be um, probably just as devastating, especially if you're an app fit, uh, focused business. Um, so, uh, Atticus, maybe you could just talk a little bit about some of the the penalties of non-compliance uh, for the PIPL. Yeah, sure. So, in addition to the you know uh, economic. Uh, uh, Monetary penalties. Uh, there are also other restrictions, or you know, the penalty. For example, I think the no notable one is um, there's a restrictions or uh, or prohibition for the for the people that you know are in breach of this uh, requirement, especially <coughs> for the person in charge or you know the uh, the head of the company. Likely the the, the this type of role uh, role uh, role. So if the company breaches this company uh, this this uh, uh, this law. Uh, there is a prohibition for, for them um, to to uh, to take the role of you know uh, director or senior management in other companies. So that's a kind of you know real uh, uh, real impact on on the uh, officers or uh, individuals for their career uh, development. So that's one thing that maybe you know this is just added in the third version of this of the draft law. So that's this maybe is notable um, to 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 you know for for companies. And uh, I, and uh, the, the last bullet point there kind of gets to that, uh, the, 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 the officer and um, 
that we talked about earlier and some of the liabilities for that person, um, whoever is appointed. Uh, Mark, uh, maybe I'll, I'll throw this one to you, but I guess the big, one of the big uh, questions that uh, you know, international companies have uh, is uh, uh, dealing with data is the cross-border transfer of it. You know, can they uh, export that data from China back to um, you know the, their HQ, for example, in order to process it or to analyze it. Um, the PIPL, uh, well, before the PIPL, it was kind of a again kind of a collage of different uh, laws that you and uh, guidances and announcements that you had to put together to kind of uh, weave some type of interpretation on how do you actually handle this cross border transfer of data issue. But the PIPL does, you know, directly address this. Um, so maybe we can just discuss a little bit about the cross-border transfer. Well, I wish we had handed this one to Sean, uh, to, to Atticus, but anyway, I'll, I'll do my best. I think, you know, look, it, it's relatively new. I haven't got it fully clear in my head, but what I'm thinking is firstly, uh, the PIPL is about personal individual data. So that's the first thing. So we have to think about what data is being addressed uh, the previous draft had a much more strict issue on cross-border transfers. It, it softened it in here. And I think probably the biggest thing is if you're a, you know, a CIAO or this new concept of what we call a mass handler, I also used the Stanford translation. I forgot what they used, but they, I, I think I wanted to make it a bit simpler. So I, you know, I used the term mass handler. Uh, uh, they will need a CAC security assessment before they can transfer personal information offshore. Um, the threshold is not specified. And the reason why we guess it's somewhere between 100,000 and a million pieces of data or 100,000 individuals or a million pe people is that 100,000 was the number set out in the gaming regulations, but also in the auto data process, I think, uh, they also had the 100,000 threshold. The million was the CAC's recent threshold uh, in order to pass a cybersecurity check if you wanted to list on an overseas uh, stock exchange. So I'm guessing it's gonna be the lower threshold because the information is more sensitive because it's like privacy and personal data, okay? Uh, I think if you're not a CIIO, which you, know, you probably are not, uh, probably most companies are not mass handlers. I don't know. I mean, it could be that, you know, depending what kind of data we're talking about, you know, many foreign companies do probably have data on 100,000 Chinese individuals. Uh, you know, if you're not within those two ones, though, there are different ways of providing it, which are on the side there. So I don't think it's the end of the world. Uh, you just have to be careful if you fall. I think the, the whole thing about this would be, if you're GDPR compliant, it's probably not a big mountain to climb. Uh, I wouldn't lose sleep uh, because you're not the target. Like Sean, you asked a few minutes ago, am I the target of this law? No, Sean, you are not the target. So most of the foreign companies are not the targets. The targets really of this are the companies that are dealing in massive amounts of personal data. So I think cross-border transfer, and look, one of the, I, I did notice there was a question about anonymized um, um, uh, transfers. Uh, look, we think that's a problem depending on what kind of data it is. If it's health related or something like that, and it's because, you know, anonymized normally means you can trace it back. Uh, you know, if you want to make it totally anonymous, you normally call it statistical data. So, you know, so I think, yeah, we'll have to follow this up later. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the data firstly is personal data. And then we're going to have to think a bit about how you're captured by other laws and also in what form the data is being transferred. Is the data no longer personal uh, individual data if it is sufficiently turned into something like statistical data? Yeah, I think uh, Atticus, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I'd like to ask you about the standard contract part of this uh, Article 38, which gets to the cross-border transfer. Um, I think it's a very interesting, uh, usually we can kind of, for example, we've pulled uh, some comparisons to the cosmetics law. We've pulled some comparisons to the, the gaming and the, the auto data laws. Um, uh, but the standard contract, the standard contract requirement for those who are, uh, 
looking to use this exemption to, uh, you know, to, to get their cross-border transfer approved, you know, what does that entail? What does that process look like? I, you know, I understand that, you know, might not all be crystal clear right now, but uh, if you could just give us some of your thoughts on, on the standard contract uh, exception. Yeah, I think maybe we, we um, discuss more background of those options available. Um, so this is actually, uh, you know, the options uh, is, uh, I think I should say that comparable to the um, to those options on the GDPR. So on the GDPR, there's, uh, you know, sufficiency analysis, and also there's a BCR uh, binding corporate rules that, you know, if the, if you are, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, falling with this scope, that's that it's easier for you to transfer those data um, uh, across board. Um, but if you transfer the, uh, there's also on the GDPR, there's also other options um, you know, similar, very similar, like like the you know the PRPL offer. So on the PRPL, actually, I think this uh, there's a less options uh, than those on the GDPR. Uh, they just they just offer um, four um, four type of options. Uh, but the, the the fourth one is uh, you know very broad, and you know other conditions the law provide. Maybe this is a long list. Uh, but the main, thing, main options now available is the the first one in the is the security assessment. That's the, maybe the strict, strict um, most strict uh, way that you need to pass the uh, assessment organized by the authority that uh, you know, um, most of the companies may want to avoid this because it's time consuming and they need to provide more, more information to that. And there's uncertainty where this can be passed. And the other one is you know, certified by a third party. Uh, you know, this third party obviously should be uh, you know, recognized by the government. And this is uh, one way that, all, uh, you know, uh, this law offer. And the one this uh, you mentioned, the standard contract, I think this is the concept borrowed from the, from the GDPR. Um, GDPR is called is SCC. Um, so um, uh, on the GDPR, this is also kind of, you know, prepared by the EDPB, um, you know, the, the, the committee that regulates um, uh, the, the law. Um, this is also similar in China. The standard contract is, you know, uh, the contract template will be issued by the CAC, the, 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 the authority like in charge of this law, mainly in charge of this law. So they will, um, they will, they will give the templates and, uh, you know, um, for all those, you know, uh, 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 attempted or, you know, pre a potential transfer, if you use this one um, uh, issued by the government, uh, you know, uh, all the terms, uh, you know, just commercial terms, you just put in all the, other terms to protect the processor or the uh, personal data subject should be in place. So that one way that you can transfer. Uh, um, this is, uh, is foreseeable, uh, you know, compared to the GDPR. So the, uh, this is the, you know, something that a uh, contract between the, the, the processor and, the, and also the, rece receip uh, the, the, the uh, recipient and they have the re uh, receive this dot data and there's clauses that how you protect them. And also if there's any issue outside China, uh, how you deal with the, you know, the data subject and it, it, there's a liability for breach. So this is a, uh, the general structure that a uh, picture that this, how this will be, uh, be, be uh, used in the future. I have a question here um, about when will the, the standard contract clause uh, when, when, when more details will be released about it. I, 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 I understand from the discussion that the CAC is going to play a big role in enforcing and also uh, fleshing out some of the details uh, you know, provided in the PIPL. Uh, do we have any idea, Atticus, maybe you, you, you're probably uh, more on the pulse here, but do we have any idea when the CAC will uh, when can we expect for, for more guidance in, re in respect to some of the, the finer points of the PIPL and its enforcement? Yeah, I think just a couple of weeks ago, the CAC said, um, just um, um, uh, issued some news on the website that uh, they are preparing the standard contract in a moment at the moment, uh, but has not issued yet. But I think that this, uh, you know, uh, just a big guess. I, I think this should be, available um, uh, before, before, you know, November, the, the first November. Otherwise, you know, this sort of, the law has already uh, come into force, but uh, there's no such option available. So that will be a difficult thing for, for, you know, for the companies to follow. 
So it seems like there is a bit of a rush from everybody to finish. Um, Even the CAC will not be in compliance. But Sean, if you just go back to that slide, I've got a question for you. I won't be able to rest. Is informatization department, it sounds like an Italian thing. It's, I thought it was just a, a, a typo, but you use it everywhere. It's not, isn't it the information department? It's not the information. To, I can't even say the bloody word. Uh, are you looking in the blue box? Every box, informatization department. I'm just wondering, it's the information yeah. department, isn't it? Or this, I thought uh, it was the, a new word. For everybody watching this, the all of the when I pull from the actual text of the of the law, I'm pulling it from the Stanford uh, the Stanford translation. But they so. use this weird word as well because I I'm, used it. I didn't notice it. Okay. I'm just oh, pulling okay. it straight from them. I think their translation is going to be a lot better than than ours. So I just okay. uh, I just pulled it from there. Okay. Um, okay. I thought it was like an Italian thing, implementation. <laughs> okay. I mean, I like noodles, but uh, not Italian. All right, so. Uh, 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 Atticus, maybe we, this is kind of like, I guess, a, um, a more of a, a summarization of uh, some of the, the processing of personal information, some of the basic rules that we can kind of impart. We only have about three minutes left, so maybe uh, we'll just, uh, Atticus, maybe we could just make it a little bit quick, but uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, all the viewers can, can uh, have a look. Yeah, sure. Um, so this slide shows, you know, those basic rules uh, on the uh, PIPL, you know, how to, uh, the companies or, or data processor, how to deal with, uh, handle, process the data. Uh, so the first one is the retention period. Um, so this is a very broad, uh, you know, how to uh, describe how long you can, uh, you know, retain this data. It's just, you know, the shortest period, you know, the minimum period that necessary. So that's the principle. Um, but I think there could be, um, um, issues that are uh, in terms of implementation, as you know, companies may think otherwise. You know, they think that the necessary period may be longer than you know the authority think. So that's what maybe some some you know controversial part. Uh, and also, the law also um, stressed the um, specify the co processing issue. For example, if the two entities or two data processors they uh, handle the the personal information and they decide how to use that, how how the purpose of this. So uh, the PRPL sets uh, uh, set joint joint liability for those um, you know processor data processor. So that makes sure that those either of them will be responsible in breach of this uh, uh, in dealing with the data. And also there's a, a, a requirement on the entrusted processing. For example, you entrust third party to do that. Um, there's, there should be you know a, a contract in between the, the two parties, and the, um, you know the, the entrusted party should. Uh, should uh, should uh, uh, obligated you know to to handle this data as agreed. So this is type of you know entrusted processing, and also the law uh, single out you know how to deal with um, uh, in terms of you know a merger or division or even um, the, the the winding up of the company. Um, so that's uh, uh, address a spe special situation, and also there's a you know um, requirement on the sharing personal information. For example, if I collect this information, uh, uh, you know the data processor collects uh, the the inf personal information, and I, I I share this information to a third party. Uh, so there's a requirement that you need to uh, you need to uh, obtain the uh, consent of the data processor, uh, 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 the data subject. And uh, for example, you know the one that received this data, uh, the data um, that I, if you change this the, the the method or the purpose, then you need to re uh, uh, re uh, uh, obtain the consent of the data subject. So that's basic the uh, basically the rules uh, basic rules um, how to deal with the personal personal data by the uh, processors. Thanks a lot. I have one last question here. Um, the question is, does the entrusted processor need to obtain consent every single time it engages a sub-processor? I assume that, you know, it would depend on the use and uh, the, the, the standard contract clause and a lot of these other, you know, it's going to be a little bit, there's going to be, the context is important, I guess, is what I'm saying. But, you know, does, is there a situation where they would need to obtain consent every single time? Um, on, under the law, uh, there's no specific requirement for, for, uh, for um, consent by the, this uh, entrusted process model. Uh, the theory, I think, behind this is uh, because you entrust this for, for them to do this, actually, the, you know, the, the other party, the entrusted parties do this on behalf of you. 
So they actually, you know, be liable together. And this is not, not the, you know, the, the joint liability, but, uh, you know, still the principal, I think, uh, should be finally uh, responsible for this. Uh, of, of course, internally, they can, uh, hit, um, the, the, the first one can recourse this from the, you know, the, the entrusted party. Uh, and <laughs> one last question. Uh, uh, will the law apply retro retroactively? Um, you know, uh, biometric data that's already been collected prior to the to the law. Um, Mark, I don't know if you. Uh, I didn't say anything. Normally, there's a presumption against it, but the issue would be um, even under the old laws, there were enough uh, restrictions. I think this just makes it clearer. I, I think uh, you'd have to. It would probably be wise uh, to move to a compliance situation. I wouldn't be asking people for retrospective um, consents, uh, but I think you would have to still think about how you're dealing with that kind of data if you're doing it, if you're putting it out in the public, if you're hitting one of those five sensitive topics, uh, that would be an issue. All right, guys. Well, we finally made it to the end. Um, like I said, a copy of this presentation will be given to everybody, but here is a... a, a a couple slides comparing the PIPL with the GDPR. Uh, of course, I will be sending a copy of this presentation to everybody and on the CC will be Mark and will be Atticus. So if you have any questions about anything specific that we discussed or maybe we haven't covered, um, this is it's a lot to swallow. So you can always feel free to just message them um, by email. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, uh, for joining. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks a lot, Atticus. And, uh, uh, stay tuned for the for the email with the copy of the presentation and also a link to the YouTube video. Yeah. Might be also worth mentioning, uh, Sean, we do have a GDPR expert in the London office who was trying to join us today, uh, but her name's Sana Duncan, and she worked for 15 years at a major financial institution in Europe. So yeah, she also will be part of the team to try to grapple with all this. Great. All right, everybody. Uh, talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks a lot, Atticus. Thank you. Bye.